Now, real quick, guys, because um, you know, I wanted to hear what y'all had to say about that. I want to show you guys, and I want to introduce you to a guys that you, a guy that you may or may not be familiar with. But again, this brother's name is. They call him the Oracle of San Quentin. His name is Curtis Carroll. I'm going to bring his picture up right now. You guys might have seen it a little bit ago. I'm going to bring his picture up here. And his quote is, I believe that financial education is the cure for guys who are chasing money. And we're going to use this audio clip. It's only 11 minutes. It's real quick, but I think it's that important. Because I watched a much longer interview that he did with uh, Vlad TV. But you guys know how I feel about Vlad TV. And I'm not going to give Vlad TV any uh, kudos over here right about now. You know, uh, so shout out to DJ Culture Vulture. But um, I want to play a clip from somewhere else different. Okay, and we're using this by way of fair use. And we are going to use it and transpose it. I'm going to pause it every so often. So that way we don't get flagged up in this thing. But I want you guys to hear a little bit of his story. This is just a smidgen of his story. Again, fair use of this. I was 14. Now, you guys can't see this part because I'm not going to show the visual because I don't want to get uh, flagged down. But uh, he's actually sitting in front of some other inmates as well as some other uh people in the audience, some regular, some regular people in the audience. But again, this is the Oracle of San Quentin, Curtis Carroll. Eight years old inside of a bowling alley. Oh, I was 14 years old inside of a bowling alley, burglarizing an arcade game. And upon exiting the building, a security guard grabbed my arm, so I ran. I ran down the street and I jumped on top of a fence. And when I got to the top, the weight of 3,000 quarters in my book bag pulled me back down to the ground. So when I came to, the security guard was standing over top of me and he said, next time you little punk steal something you can carry. <laughs> I was taking a juvenile hall. And when I was released into the custody of my mother, the first words my uncle said was, how'd you get caught? I said, man, the book bag was too heavy. He said, man, you weren't supposed to take all the quarters. I said, man, it was small. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> And 10 minutes later, he took me to burglarize another arcade game. He needed gas money to get home. That was my life. I grew up in Oakland, California with my mother and members of my immediate family addicted to crack cocaine. My environment consisted of living with family, friends, and homeless shelters. Again, we are using this video by way of fair use. We're going to use it and transpose it. Oftentimes, Dinner was served in bread lines and soup kitchens. The big homie told me this, money rules the world and everything in it. And in these streets, money is king. And if you follow the money, it'll lead you to the bad guy or the good guy. And now what RC said, follow the money. Soon after, I committed my first crime. And it was the first time that I was told that I had potential and felt like somebody believed in me. Nobody ever told me that I could be a lawyer, doctor, or engineer. I mean, how was I supposed to do that? I couldn't read, write, or spell. I was illiterate. So I always thought crime was my way to go. Keep in mind, he said he couldn't read or write. He was illiterate. And I want you guys to hear, I think he's going to say, you know, how he was able to learn to read and write. And then one day, I was talking to somebody, and he was telling me about this robbery that we can do. We did it. The reality was, was that I was growing up in the strongest financial nation in the world, the United States of America, while I watched my mother stand in line at a blood bank to sell her blood for $40 just to try to feed her kids. She still has the needle marks on her arms to this day to show for that. So I never cared about my community. They didn't care about my life. Everybody there was doing what they was doing to take what they wanted. The drug dealers, the robbers, the blood bank. Everybody was taking blood money. So I got mine by any means necessary. I got mine. And, and again, the reason why I'm having to pause so much is just so we don't get flagged down. So we're supposed to use this and talk about it in between sections. Again, you guys make sure and look this gentleman up, the Oracle of San Quentin. Financial literacy really did rule the world. And I was a child slave to it, following the bad guy. 
At 17 years old, I was arrested for robbery murder. And I soon learned that finances in prison rule more than they did on the streets, so I wanted in. One day, I rushed to grab the sports page of the newspaper so my cellie can read it to me. And I accidentally picked up the business section. And this old man said, hey, youngster, you pick stocks? And I said, what's that? He said, that's the place where white folks keep all their money. <laughs> and it was the first time that I had saw a glimpse of hope, a future. He gave me this brief description of what stocks were, but it was just a glimpse. And again, and that's, and that's why I feel like what we do here is important. Just sometimes just speaking the information and putting it out there, very important. Somebody's going to hear it. It's going to mean something to somebody. I mean, how was I supposed to do it? I couldn't read, write, or spell. The skills that I had developed to hide my literacy no longer worked in this environment. I was trapped in a cage, prey among predators, fighting for freedom I never had. I was lost, tired, and I was out of options. So at 20 years old, I did the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. I picked up a book. Now, what was that that I said earlier? The money is hidden where? The money is hidden where? In the oh. books. In books. In the books. And it was the most agonizing time of my life. Keep in mind, this is for somebody that's illiterate. Trying to learn how to read. The ostracizing from my family. The homies. It was rough, man. It was a struggle. But little did I know, I was receiving the greatest gifts I'd ever dreamed of. Self-worth, knowledge, discipline. I was so excited to be reading that I read everything I can get my hands on. Candy wrappers, clothing logos, street signs, everything. I was just reading stuff. Just reading stuff. I was so excited to know how to read and know how to spell. Homie came up and said, man, what you eating? I said, C-A-N-D-Y, candy. <laughs> he said, let me get some. I said, N-O, no. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, I can. And watching him do this live was amazing. And, and, and this guy is, like I said, was illiterate. And to watch him get up and just talk like that was just, wow. Guys have got to look him up. Actually, now for the first time in my life, read. The feeling that I got from it was amazing. And then at 22, feeling myself, feeling confident, I remember what the OG told me. So I picked up the business section of the newspaper. I wanted to find these rich white folks. <laughs> so I looked for that glimpse. As I further my career in teaching others how to financially manage money and invest, I soon learned that I had to take responsibility for my own actions. True, I grew up in a very complex environment, but I chose to commit crimes, and I had to own up to that. Uh, Southern Girl Oracle, yes. His name is the, uh, the San Quentin Oracle. If you look up San Quentin Oracle, you'll be able to find him. I had to take responsibility for that, and I did. I was building a curriculum that could teach incarcerated men how to manage money through prison employments. Properly managing our lifestyle will provide transferable tools that we can use to manage money when we re-enter society, like the majority of people did who didn't commit crimes. Then I discovered that according to MarketWatch, over 60% of the American population has under $1,000 in savings. Sports Illustrated said that over 60% of NBA players and NFL players go broke. 40% of marital problems derive from financial issues. Now, I don't know if y'all could tell, but they actually cut a little bit of portion of that. I hate that they did that, but I know they were trying to keep the uh, constraints down for that particular video. We just talk about the, uh, the NFL players and NBA players. Well, I've already given you guys that statistic. 3.3 years and only two, less than 2% of those people uh, actually make it to the NFL. And, and um, on an average career, that's the top earners and uh, people that earn league minimum. It's $1.9 million. And after three years, that'd be $5.7 million that they're supposed to try to figure out how to live the rest of their life with that. And most of them end up filing for bankruptcy, and especially in the NFL or the uh, NBA. Right. The hell? <laughs> you mean to tell me that people work their whole lives buying cars, clothes, homes, 
and material stuff, but we're living check to check. How in the world were members of society going to help incarcerated individuals back into society if they couldn't manage their own stuff? We screwed. <laughs> I needed a better plan. This is not going to work out too well. So I thought. And the point of this, uh, Bill, he said a positive criminal. The point of this is to show that not only that we do that the prison, the pipe, uh, the school to prison pipeline does exist, but the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a situation that normally is just, there is no rehab in prison, but this brother rehabbed himself simply by picking up a book and becoming interested. And just showing the power that reading has. Why not? I now had an obligation to meet those on the path. <coughs> Yo, and it was crazy because I now cared about my community. Wow, imagine that. I cared about my community. Financial illiteracy is a disease that has crippled minorities in the lower class in our society for generations and generations. So we should be furious about that. <laughs> Ask yourselves this. How can 50% of the American population be financially illiterate in the nation driven by financial prosperity? Our access to justice, our social status, living conditions, transportation, and food are all dependent on money that most people can't manage. It's crazy. Chris Davenport, who is the guy that is talking? Hmm? Chris Davenport asks, who is the guy that's talking? On the screen. That is yeah, that is Curtis Carroll. We would call the San Quentin Oracle. The San Quentin Oracle. Mm -hmm. It's an epidemic and a bigger danger to public safety than any other issue. Huh? According to the California Department of Corrections, over 70% of those incarcerated have committed or have been charged with money-related crimes, robberies, burglaries, fraud, larceny, extortion, and the list goes on. Check this out. A typical incarcerated person would enter the California prison system with no financial education, earn 30 cents an hour, over $800 a year, with no real expenses, and save no money. Upon his parole, he will be given $200 gate money and told, hey, good luck, stay out of trouble, don't come back to prison. With no meaningful preparation or long-term financial plan, what does he do? Great point. At 60, get a good job or go back to the very criminal behavior that led him to prison in the first place. Before you do that, won't you go you taxpayer all the dishes out the sink so when you start washing dishes, if you're talking? Hold on, hold on, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Because you choose. Well, his education already chose for him, probably. So how do we cure this disease? I co-founded a program that we call Financial Empowerment Emotional Literacy. We call it FEEL. And it teaches how do you separate your emotional decisions from your financial decisions. And the four timeless rules to personal finance. Edwin, yes. They give people money when they're released from prison. $200. And a food stamp. Unfortunately, I actually have some people in my family that I can speak on that behalf that were in the penitentiary. There are two bids. So I, 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 yes, yeah. The proper way to save, control your cost of living, borrow money effectively, and diversify your finances by allowing your money to work for you instead of you working for it. Incarcerated people need these life skills before we re-enter society. You can't have full rehabilitation without these life skills. This idea that only professionals can invest and manage money is absolutely ridiculous. And whoever told you that is lying. Now, I will say this. Uh, Sway in the morning actually was the guy that ended up interviewing this gentleman. But uh, the, the video... To, uh, to the full interview, not this particular uh, speaking, 
but the the, uh, the actual interview that gives a little more in depth about this person, which I thought was pretty insightful, was actually uh, on uh, <coughs> with, uh, DJ Culture Vultures uh, page. So you guys can look, guys can look that up. Shout out to Vlad. A professional is a person who knows his craft better than most, and nobody knows how much money you need, have, or want better than you, which means you are the professional. Financial literacy is not a skill, ladies and gentlemen. It's a lifestyle. Financial stability is a byproduct of a proper lifestyle. A financially sound incarcerated person can become a taxpayer citizen. And a financially sound taxpayer citizen can remain one. This allows us to create a bridge between those people who we influence, family, friends, and those young people who still believe that crime and money are related. So let's lose the fear and anxiety for all the big financial words and all that other nonsense that you've been out there hearing. And let's get to the heart of what's been crippling our society from taking care of your responsibility to be better life managers. And let's provide a simple and easily to use curriculum that gets to the heart, the heart of what financial empowerment and emotional literacy really is. Now, if you sitting out here in the audience and you said, oh yeah, well that ain't me and I don't buy it, then come take my class. <laughs> so I can show you how much money it costs you every time you get emotional. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, you guys can unmute. Again, we use that video by way of fair use for that audio. You're going to use it and transpose it. Not only did we do that throughout the video and the audio, but we're going to do that now. So, fair use. <laughs> 